How you doing? My name is Seth McIntyre. I'm an instructor here at the Stonmark Animal Behavior Center in Hutto. Our facility is a couple hundred acres of dog heaven. Uh, we do anything from boarding, long-term boarding, short-term boarding, uh, lots of amenities for the dog staying, such as be beach clubs and nature walks and stuff like that, to training. Uh, we have a great training department that comes out. They do anything from in-home lessons, go or uh, stay in trains, private lessons, uh, group classes, anything you uh, want to teach your dog. One of my favorite favorite parts about being an instructor here is uh, all of our students get assigned at least one uh, green or untrained rescue dog. Um, we work with many uh, shelters in the area, including Pflugerville, um, as far out as Houston and Dallas. We get dogs that come in, we give the students an opportunity to train a dog they've never met before. And we also give the rescue dogs the opportunity to meet p potential adopters. Uh, many times our students adopt the dog that they spend 12 weeks training. It just sets every rescue dog up for success with their next adoption. So uh, today you guys are here to pick up uh, Gypsy, Rolex, and Jones. All right. So uh, the first thing we're going to cover is the obedience they learned while they were here. So as you all can see, um, this is the command we call place. Uh, place is just a boundary stay. So all that means is they can, as long as they're staying on the bound or within the boundary, which obviously is very defined with these beds, um, and they're being polite, then they're they're doing the command correctly. And uh, you may see them reward periodically, and that's just them telling the dog, "Hey, I like what you're doing." Um, we prefer calm, calm behavior, such as laying down, um, sitting, stuff like that. When you first introduce a dog to the place bed, many times they just stand the whole time. And people feel the need to start trying to give other commands on the bed, but that takes away from the, the original command itself, which is place. So the best option would be to, uh, the dog offers a sit or offers a down on the place bed, then you just reward them at that time and that just tells them, hey, I like that calm behavior on the bed. Um, so from here, what I'll do is I'll have each person, they'll kind of take their dog off a of place, um, show you how, uh, you know, how you give the command putting on, and then uh, they'll each take turns doing some distractions so you can, guys can see the, the stay portion. So Sabrina, if you want to go first. So again, she's just rewarding. She told him place, or told her place. So at this point, um, Gypsy is on the bed until she's either given the release command, which is free, or given an, another obedience command, such as heal or a recall or something like that. So Cheyenne, go ahead. When I take him off, I'm just gonna tell him free. There you go. Go ahead, Mike. As you can see, um, this command is probably one of the easiest ones. Uh, it creates a very quick reward history with the bed itself, so they get very excited to get on place because they know, hey, I just hang out here and treats magically come. <laughs> so. If you noticed, all three of them, when they gave the dog the treat, they didn't hand it to them, they put it on the bed. The reason that we put the treat on the bed is because it helps decrease anticipation. So if Mike, let's say, was 30 feet away and he put his hand in his treat pouch, Rolex obviously knows that that pouch is full of good stuff for him. So at first the dog might say, hey, let me save you some time and I'll come to you and get the treat. And at that point, he will have broken the place command and lost his reward. So instead of um, creating that anticipation, he knows I have to stay here because the reward ends up on the bed anyways. So it just helps teach the dog, staying here is what I want you to do. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions on place? No? All right. So next, uh, I'll talk about the heel. So the heel is simple, uh, lots of people We'll refer to it as a loose leash walk um, up until you get them into that point where they should be in a small box right on your left hand side. So 
Uh, we started with what we call the attention game, and that's just making a lot of quick turns. When the dog stops paying attention to me, I'm gonna change direction. That teaches them to pay attention to your movement. And then once they start getting um, stuck a little bit closer to that side, we start introducing the heel command. And at that point, it becomes obedience, and they'll provide the dog the proper feedback, whether they're in the box, they're doing a great job, you'll see them reward, or if uh, they get distracted, step outside that area where they're supposed to be, it's just a small correction with a pop and release on uh, their training equipment. So Sabrina, go ahead and do a little heel. Uh, no, you just walk around with it. So as you can see with Gypsy, she has quite the attention heel. So the difference between a normal heel and an attention heel is Gypsy spends a lot of her time looking up at her handler. Uh, it's something that uh, the students reinforced over time. Anytime the dog would look up at them while they were healing, they would reward them. So just like anything, if you like what a dog's doing and you give them reinforcement, you give them a reward, they start offering it more and more, and you end up with an attention heel like that. Whenever you're ready. So again, um, so Jones checks in, you can see, but he doesn't stare the whole time. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just two different types of heels, the attention heel and a normal heel. This is something that most people would use when you're out on a walk around your neighborhood. Helps keep the dog from lunging and being at the end of the leash, pulling, making that walk not very enjoyable for you or the dog. Mike, go ahead. Now Mike um, and Gypsy, so Mike used Rolex and Sabrina used Gypsy for c the competitive obedience portion. So that's another big reason why you see that attention heel. And then once um, something's been reinforced as much, even when you don't ask for it, the dogs normally offer it. Does anyone have any questions on the heel? Nope. All right, so the next thing we'll go over is the sit. Very simple command. Here at Starmark, we don't teach the word stay we use what we call implied stays. All that means is when our trainers give the dog a command sit, that means that the dog sits and it stays in that position until once again they're released using the release word which is free or um, they're given another command such as heal or come. Whenever you're ready. Very nice. Can you step away? Oh, <laughs> try again. She's like, we're really close to the place bed. And believe it or not, that's pretty typical. Um, because the place bed is so rewarding, uh, if they have the opportunity to get on it, they typically do. Very nice. So again, she stays, and then she can go back, reward, and uh, she can either release her, so she could tell her, hey, go be a dog, or if she wanted to heal away with her, she would just tell her, heal, and start walking. <laughs> She's like, oh, can I have it back now? <laughs> All right, so go ahead and do a little bit of healing. Um, do some auto halts, too. So what an auto halt is, is we started teaching the dogs, instead of me having to tell you sit every time I stop, when I stop, you sit. So the dog stops with you and waits patiently, and once again, now the dog is in a sit, so you'll remind him heel and just start walking again, and he should follow. Probably one of the most important things you can hear her praising him. Pet and praise and treats, dogs love all of those. But pet and praise, you have on you at all times. So always pet and praise when you're getting behavior. You might not have that treat on you, and that's okay. Um, always pet and praise when they're doing good behavior. 
Dogs understand that, that bubbly voice, that high pitch kind of, oh, that's a good boy, or that's a good girl, all right? So pet and praise is always a big part of training. You're good? Yeah. Go ahead. Like. So go ahead and do some sits. You can step out to the end of your leash, walk around. So if he breaks, you're going to mark it no, give him a pop and release, remind him sit, and step back out. Now go back. So we always give him an opportunity to fix themselves. So he made the mistake, and Mike put him back in the position and stepped back out, gave him a chance to be successful, went back, reward, and then uh, moved on with his training. So anytime a dog makes a mistake, if you have the opportunity to recreate whatever that mistake was in a safe environment, then recreate that mistake and help teach the dog what the right choice is. So we're not looking to make choices for our dogs. We want them to make the right choices on their own. And they can't do that unless we show them what the right choice is. Any questions on the sit? All right. So next up, we'll cover the down. The down. Um, that's the command we use. Lots of people lay down or whatever, um, but that's the one we teach. The down is just like the sit. It's an implied stay, and all that means is the dog is in a down from the, from the, the time the command's given until freed or given another obedience command. So go ahead if you want to demonstrate the down. So during class, um, we've gotten all the way to the point where we're doing up to 30 feet of, of stays. Um, with some of the dogs, um, we get all the way to off leash, uh, but that's based on a lot of different things. Uh, the biggest thing though is that down should main, remain reliable at 30 feet, and then you can go back and reward. So. The down is a longer term stay as opposed to the sit. You would use a sit if you ran into someone while you were out for a walk and you were talking for a second, you could use a sit. Uh, if you're gonna be there for any ex extended period of time, I recommend putting your dog into a down and that's just because the down's a much more comfortable position for a dog. Sit takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of muscle and it takes a lot of concentration. Down, again, more relaxing. Um, gives them an opportunity to be a little bit more comfortable even though they have to stay, stay in the same position. So just like with place, um, if you're working on downs or teaching downs, we recommend, again, not handing the treat to the dog but actually placing the tree on the floor kind of between his paws. So where his head is now, um, as you just saw, your reward on the ground between the paws, because again, not only now if I'm coming from distance, he may come and get it, but even if I'm right here and I go to give a treat, he may break that down, come up, and up towards a sit just to meet you. So again, they tend to stay if they know the reward's coming right here where I am instead of someplace else. So thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Place. Very nice. All right. So, like as you can see, there's a bunch of different ways, but all of them went into the down, and they're all waiting patiently for the treat between the paws, and that's what a good reward history and clear communication does for each dog. So lastly is recalls. Um, recalls are pretty basic. Anybody have a long line on them? You got one? All right. Derek's got one. So um, we'll do some recalls real quick. Oh, thank you. I got one. So each recall is different. Uh, I don't know what, did you use come or here? Yeah, so um, typically the most 
widely used recalls are come, the recall words are come and here. We kind of let the, choose, the, the student choose whichever one's more natural. Um, everyone's kind of different, There's, but most of the time it's either more natural to say come or here for the person. So they'll do their recall. So uh, you can go ahead and if she'll leave you. <laughs> So uh, typically what happens when you spend this much time training with a dog, the hard part is actually getting them to go away from you, not getting them to come back. So I'll see, I'm going to help by seeing if I can distract her a little bit. Hey, Momos. Hey, what you got? What you got here? So that's a, an actual um, front. So that's a competitive obedience uh, position right there where the dog comes at a 90 degree angle and sits right there in front of you. Um, again, she used her for competitive obedience, so it, start, it comes pretty natural to her. Uh, but typically what we taught was you come to me and you sit. It doesn't have to be directly in front of me like a competitive obedience, but you come into my bubble and you sit. Now the reason that we taught come into my bubble and sit is because technically I could do this. If she was to call me, I could come over and I came into her bubble. And if there was no other requirements, then I actually did the recall. I just wasn't finished playing yet. So I didn't want to stay. So again, the implied stay of the sit. So they're supposed to come in and sit and wait for another command. So they don't just get to run up and drive by and keep running. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> hey. Hey, puppies. Jones. He's like, no, not so much. What are you doing? What are you doing? Come. Very nice. And again, you see he sat and stayed. So she'll give him another command, heal, and she, then he's now with her. All right, I'm going to hand off the, uh... thank you. <laughs> He's like, not so much, not tricking me. Hey, relax. We do, Bubbles. We do. <laughs> yeah. And this is, like I said, this is very typical. You spend 12 weeks with a dog training, and they tend not to leave your side after that. Uh, we like to refer to them. You know, we we created Velcro dogs. They're stuck to us, which is something that most people enjoy. Um, but it makes teaching or doing recalls a little bit more difficult. Hey, relax. Can I have some food? <laughs> Come. <laughs> and there you go. So the recall back to him and the sit in his bubble. So that's what we're looking for when we initially teach a recall. And like I said, we started with just teaching what the word means. And then we added in the sit later on. Once coming back to us was rewarding. Then it was, all right, now there's a new requirement. You come back and you sit and you stay in my bubble until I, I tell you otherwise. So that kind of concludes our basic obedience uh, type portion of this demonstration. So we have some scent work and some clicker tricks, right? Clicker tricks? Um, he did a little bit of the service dog. Or ser I'm sorry, service dog tasks, not clicker tricks. So uh, some scent work and some service dog tasks. Um, competitive obedience. A little bit of competitive obedience. Uh, maybe Mike can demonstrate some in motion exercises. Uh, which is pretty much changing the picture completely for a dog. Normally when you give a dog a command, you're stationary. So uh, one of the parts of competitive obedience is being able to walk and tell the dog to sit. The dog stops and sits and you just continue to walk. It's a very, very challenging task to complete uh, because it's such a change in picture. Um, dogs learn in pictures. Uh, obviously they can't read like we can, but Every, they have very photographic memories. They remember everything like a snapshot. And from there, we just create the picture. And when you change it, sometimes it takes a little bit to get them on the same page. So 
uh, we'll set up for the next things. Yes, ma'am? Um, so they're going back to the shelter, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, how long are we going to be treating training? I mean, is there a point where we don't have to treat? Or? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, lots of people want to get away from treats. And yes, you should fade away from treats. <laughs> But the, down, the, the one thing to remember is you want to get on a schedule, like an intermittent schedule, and you can use treats only every once in a while. All right? You never want to completely take treats away, and that's because part of, so the, the reason they're so happy and bubbly and excited to do obedience is because of the treats. The reason they do the obedience, um, even when they don't want the treat, is because they have discipline. So we've taught them, you know, the fun side and discipline. So we put it all together, and that's why you see fun, happy dogs doing great obedience. Um, if you completely take away the treats forever and never give them a treat again, that they may still stay obedient, but you may see that their demeanor change. So if you think about it like people that play the lottery, all right? So if you only give a treat every once in a while, there's still the thought in their head, maybe this time. Maybe this time I'm going to treat. Maybe this time I'm going to get a treat. Maybe this time. And if it just goes so long that they don't ever see a treat for anything, eventually they're like, okay, I'll do it. So that's kind of where it's at. Um, and that's about where all of these dogs are. You don't have to treat for every single piece of obedience. Um, but again, I wouldn't ever completely take away reward because, I mean, who wants to work for free? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, that's a very long conversation. Uh, but the basics of remote collar are uh, you start with very, very, very low levels. And we actually, so kind of to get into equipment a little bit, uh, prong collars, martingales, pinch collars, choke chains, all of those slip, slip leashes, all of those are designed to imitate a correction bite from another dog. It's a language that every dog is pretty much born understanding because they, they, they're born into a litter and that's how they communicate. So it's very simple. So it doesn't take much for a dog to understand what that, correct, that it is a correction. As far as e-collars or remote collars go, it's a very foreign feeling. Who here has ever felt a, like a TENS unit, like a muscle stimulation unit? That's what they feel like. Um, it's not an electric shock. There's no, like if you were to throw it in a, in a uh, swimming pool and push the button, everyone in the pool is not gonna you know, start getting electrocuted. Um, that's quite a big myth. Um, but, so you start with a very, very low level that they can just barely feel. And all you do is teach them what it means. Because to them, there's not, nothing in the natural world that feels that way. So we have to actually explain it and teach it in a very, um, controlled low-level man manner because if you're trying to use high levels they're not going to learn anything because they're going to be so focused on the feeling and not on what you're teaching. So we actually paired it to all their obedience afterwards. Uh, I guess what I was just basically to ask him is, is it recommended that she has something like that or is it just How is she leash? without it? Yeah, most of the time um, I would recommend like all of my dogs are on remote collar and that's because I like to do off-leash things with my dog. Not that he, none of my, you know, all my dogs are very well trained. Um, they spend a lot of time with me off leash. But at the same time, if let's say a squirrel runs by, it may take me quite a few seconds. If not, you know, my do dog might blow me off and just keep chasing a squirrel. If that squirrel crosses the street, now my dog's chasing a, a squirrel across the street. I have no way to get him. So I have my remote collar on my dogs for that emergency situation. So. I look at it as something that could potentially, it's kind of like a seatbelt. You don't always need it, but when you need it, you really need it. And uh, it can say, just like a seatbelt can save your life, um, having a remote collar on an off-leash dog can save theirs, so. And did you only use it for, for off-leash work? Um, let me hold the hand, it's a, what I found is it just was um, lower level, lower level issues than say a prong does for me. It was no. high strength and her strength. So it just was much less um, challenging for us to work through in whatever way she chose. So kind of. That's what she was technically wearing was a slip. Yep. 
So kind of to, to clarify, if, if you didn't kind of catch what she was saying is, so with a prong collar or a slip collar, that leash that's attached to you, you're pulling on that leash. So even though it's a pop and release, it's a pop and release between you and the dog. As far as the remote collar is concerned, there's no direct tie. Yes, the dog knows that you are the one with the remote, but it's not you reaching for your dog to give them a correction. It's just there. So technically, the way we teach it is we teach the dog they have the power to turn it on, to turn it on, and to turn it off. So they're in control of it. You, you do the right thing. You make the good choices. You're fine. You go outside that box, like uh, using it for place. Um, we, we like to call the floor is lava. It's a good example. Um, the floor is lava, so the dog steps off place, the low level stem comes on, they get back on, it goes off. So then they understand, okay, I'm in control of this. If I get off place, it turns on. If I get on, it turns off. So then it actually empowers the dog, which is actually something that's very good for um, dogs that aren't as confident. And that's because there's no negative interaction between uh, the handler and the dog. The dog's only interaction between their human has nothing to do with a correction leash or a piece of equipment. It's just all praise pets and love. So, um, and one of the things that Sabrina touched on is obviously Gypsy is a very large, very strong dog. And no offense to her, but she's petite and <laughs> maybe not quite as strong. Dogs on average are four times stronger per pound than a human. So, <laughs> So for her to handle Gypsy, one of the things that can help is a remote collar because there, it doesn't require as much strength on her part. Any other questions? Very good questions, thank you. That's a good boy. Yeah, that's a good boy. That's a good boy. Yes. Good boy. Not too close to another dog here. All right. Jones, switch. Yes. Good boy. That's a good boy. Switch. That's a good boy. Yes. Crank. That's a good boy. <laughs> good boy. <laughs> 